everyone. Let's stand together. Have you come to worship the Lord tonight? I said, have you come to worship the Lord tonight on this Wednesday night? Amen. Amen. It's good to be in the Lord's house. Why don't we just lift our hands and invite his presence into this place. Hallelujah. Lord, we welcome you tonight. We thank you for this privilege, Lord, to be in your presence.
worship you, Jesus. Oh, bless How many you, of you are in the house tonight and you need God to be your healer? Yes. Oh, yeah. How many of you need him to be your deliverer? Yes. The good news is that whatever you need, God is here to supply your need tonight. We're going to take this service to a time of prayer right now. If you have any needs you'd like to mention, you can do that at this time. obviously so we need to remember Chloe tonight she needs healing in her body we need to remember Bill Jones um, he has been transferred to rehab unit and doing better still but he needs prayer tonight and we know God's been working in him so let's just continue to believe that God is not finished with him yet let's remember Brother Steve Cummins tonight we I've been talking about how he has cancer and it's uh, more extensive than they previously thought. He needs more surgery. We know God can heal cancer. We know that he can guide the surgeon's hands, whatever that he needs. Yes. And our God can supply that need for him. Let's remember Aubrey Dixon's tonight. She's recovering from surgery. And let's remember our community that they would continue to receive revelation of truth tonight because we all in this place know that if there's one thing that we ever all needed in common it was to know the truth about Jesus and Amen. to know how to be saved and, and to know how to get to the kingdom of heaven so let's remember our community tonight because there's still people out there a lot of people out there that need to know about God and they need to know about salvation most importantly in their life tonight. So let's go to him and take these needs before him right now. Lord, we praise you, God. We pray you. We thank you for another opportunity, Lord, to come into your house and to bring our needs before you, God. We thank you for what you've done for us on the cross, Lord. Because of what you've done, Lord, we can be healed and we can be delivered and we can be saved, God. In the name of Jesus, right now, I pray that you would just touch Bill Jones, God. We pray that you would touch Chloe, God, and her body tonight. We pray that you would continue to touch Brother Steve and help him, God, and strengthen him. We thank you for what you've done, God, in Aubrey's life, the, the, uh, the recovery that you've given her, Lord. God, we pray that you would continue to help her to recover. In Jesus' name. God, I pray right now that you would just touch Sister Pam, God, and keep your hand upon her, Lord, as she's out traveling with her family, Lord. In the name of Jesus, I pray right now, God, that you would just move in our community, Lord, continually as you always do, God. Use each one of us to go out and to preach the truth to someone this week, God, so that someone can be spared from the pits of hell, God. In the name of Jesus. Praise you, God. I thank you for your truth, Lord, and what it's done in each one of our lives, God. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name. Jesus. No one can touch your life.
situation is, doesn't matter where you are or what kind of situation you're in, nobody can touch you like Jesus can. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. We're going to take just a little different turn from the Antichrist and the false prophet. But in prayer today, I was talking to the Lord and focusing on his word and it seemed like I was just so burdened, so burdened for souls and people that have totally ignore God, totally take God for granted. I don't want to be one of those people that just cast God off to the side as if he's just a need just when we got to have him, he's there. But I want to, and I want you to know tonight also that God is a God at hand. He's a God that is, that is always present with you. He's not a God that just because you thought you needed him yesterday and he didn't answer your prayer as you thought that it ought to be answered. Because God knows best. Yes. He knows what's around the corner. He knows what tomorrow holds. You see, he's an all-knowing God. Yes, he is. Amen. An all-seeing God. He knows what's going to happen tomorrow. He knows what's going to happen next year. He's a God at hand, not a God far off. He's a God that always will be above everything else. And I will give you some advice tonight. Make God your all in all. Yes. Put him first in everything. And one of the hardest things I think Christians have they find it to be the hardest thing is to put God first in their finances. And I'm not, believe me, I ain't none of my business. I don't care if you got a million dollars or you got a dollar. It's just none of my business. I don't care. And uh, But what I am saying tonight in that respect is simply this, that you wouldn't have that dollar if God didn't bless you with it. That's right. Amen. You wouldn't have whatever you have if God didn't bless you with it. So it ought to be given back to God. It ought to be put into his kingdom and in his work. Well, that's, that's a totally different message. Huh? <laughs> but I'm sold out, Christian friend. I am sold out to this. I, I love God. Me and my wife, my family, we love God. We love the kingdom of God. We want to see it prosper yes. because this is eternity. This is Amen. going to be where we, where we wind up eternally. And I don't want any weights on me. I don't want to say, well, I'm going to take my possessions with me when I go because that's not going to happen. 
and I hope that I can get to this lesson. But in Matthew, the seventh chapter, we were talking about the false prophet. I think you got the, the gist of it. I think you understand that there's going to be two that's going to rule the world. There's going to be a political leader, and then there's going to be a false prophet. And the false prophet's going to be his right-hand man of the Antichrist. And he's going to promote the Antichrist and everything that he does. He's going to be yes. a religious leader. And uh, if you don't worship the way he says for you to worship, then uh, you're going to go and be persecuted. You're going to be uh, 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 you're going to be uh, marked as a outsider. You're going to be the one that's going to have to uh, go undercover to really worship God, the true living God. Now, if you agree or disagree, it's really irrelevant to the fact that uh, false prophet will be on the world stage and he will take his position and uh, you will find out everybody will find out exactly how things are going are going to be and we can uh, well let me put it this way you got the word of God yes he give it to you Inspired men of God wrote the word of God. Yes. So if you disagree with what the word of God teaches, yeah. which would be very foolish for any individual to take God's word and, and disagree and, and not agree with what God says, this is the way it's going to be. Yeah. So it would be very foolish for us to question God and his, his word and his, in his writings. But in Matthew, the seventh chapter, you know, Jesus gave us many warnings while he was here on earth. He, he exposed a lot of things to his disciples. Thus, his disciples uh, divulged a lot of things to uh, the Gentile race, the Jewish world, and all religious people that just kind of trickled down, and it was written down in the Word of God. But Jesus gave many warnings. He uh, let them know that there would be men that would be false. They would lie. They would cheat. They would deceive. Matthew 7, 13 through 15. I'll read you some of this. Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Beware. Jesus is giving us a warning here. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly. They are raving wolves. Now, the Bible teaches about the false prophet that he's going to be, in a sense, in appearance of a sheep or, or uh, something that is gentle. And he's going to be gentle speaking. He's going to be gently persuaded. But Jesus said... But inwardly, he was going to be a raving wolf. Now, I don't know, I've never seen a wolf, a real one. I've seen pictures, and I've uh, seen them on uh, 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 these nature shows, and they're beautiful animals, but uh, I would not want to come face to face with one, uh, a wild one that would, uh, have you ever seen the wolf how that he'll bare his teeth and he's not friendly. You don't approach a wild wolf and reach out to pet him like you would my beagles <laughs> or Sister Jenny's pups or uh, your animals or your pets. You wouldn't reach out and try to pet a wolf that way because they would no doubt look at you like, hey, you're, you're fixing to be my supper. Mm -hmm. So the false prophet he might look like a 
caring individual, one that would love you and would take care of you and, and you would build confidence in him. But inwardly, Jesus said, he's a raving wolf. Matthew 24, of course, is more speakings that Jesus warned us of. And we all know that if you've read it any amount of times, that you know that the disciples were taking Jesus through the temple that was destroyed by the Romans. And we're waiting for them to rebuild another one here probably when the covenant is signed. But as they walked through the temple and they were showing Jesus all the beautiful pillars and all the beautiful furniture and all the beautiful array that was in the temple, Jesus said, you know, this is all real nice. This is cozy. This is, you know, God's pleased in this. He didn't use these words, but he said, but listen, there's not going to be one stone left standing in this temple. Well, when he said that, when he said, see ye not all these things? And he said, verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now that blowed the disciples' minds because that was the temple of God. Yeah. That was uh, where they done their daily sacrifices and how that they worshiped God. And that, that blowed their mind that their master would tell them not one stone is going to be left standing. And he said, and he sat down on the Mount of Olives and the disciples came unto him privately saying, tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the signs of thy coming? And what shall be the sign of thy coming in of the end of the world? Yes. Now they were curious and they wanted to know. They, they, they had to know. So Jesus opened up what those, us country boys call open up a bucket of worms here. Yeah. Yeah. You got our curiosity up. Yes. What shall be the sign of thy coming. See, they were talking about Jesus coming. What shall be the sign of your coming again? You're already here. We know you're going to be crucified and rose the third day and you're going to go back into heaven. But what is, shall be the sign of thy coming? Yes. And the end of the world. Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed. Whew, there's that word again. Matthew 7, he said, take heed. Now again, he's saying, take heed that no man deceive you. How easy is it going to be to fool some people that follow the Christian walk? <coughs> Who's going to be deceived by the one that that claims to be Christ, that is nothing but a raven wolf. Yes. Well, it's not going to be me. Thank you, Jesus. I know who he is. Amen. I've read the book, and I've read the back of the book, and he wins. Yes. Uh, Amen. Man, so we win. If he wins, we win. Yes. <laughs> Jesus answered, said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Ye shall hear of wars, rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. You see, Jesus is telling them, he's letting them know right up front. It's going to be wars and rumors of wars. Uh, there's going to be trouble for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. But it's coming. Now, he didn't say that, but I just kind of ad lib. It is coming. Yes. For nations shall rise against nations, 
kingdoms against kingdoms. And there shall be famine, famines, pestilence, earthquakes in diverse places. All these things are the beginning of sorrow. You know, we're living in that time. There's earthquakes happening all the time. There's disasters all over the world. There's fires that just does not seem to be able to quench. The fires that are burning up the land. There's floods that are just flooding and wiping out cities and, and just destroying people's lives. But the end is not yet. These are signs. These are warnings. These are things that are coming to pass upon the earth that has been prophesied about. All these things are the beginning of sorrow. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Boy, ain't, we, ain't that the day we live in? Have you ever seen so much hatred and strife and trouble between political parties, between families, between, between just neighbors, just Chicago? Take that on for an example. Every day, 50, 60 people are shot down, killed, murdered. We're living in this day. Little children get in the path of some maniac with a gun and they take that child's life. Do we, does this world need Jesus? In the worst way. How are they going to get Jesus? Through me and you. We are the ambassadors for Christ. And he went on to say, and many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. So how are we going to be saved from all this chaos and all this craziness in the world? The Bible said, Jesus said, he that endureth. To the end shall be saved. And the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation. Now we know what that is, don't we? Because we've preached it here over and over and over. You should know what the abomination of desolation is. That's when the false... Uh, Antichrist stands in the temple and declares himself to be God and having people to fall down and worship him. That's the abomination in the temple of God being performed. So that's the abomination of desolation. And it was also spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whosoever readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountain. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house, neither let him which is in the field return to take his clothes. Woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days, but pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be. Hallelujah. <laughs> We are living in these days that Jesus spoke about. I know, you know, we're kind of in the rural type areas that we don't live in all the chaos and the craziness in the big cities and 
Uh, I wouldn't know what to do in a big city. I wouldn't know my way around. I wouldn't even try to get around. I, I'd be scared to death because I'm, I'm just an old country boy. If it ain't a gravel road, I don't know which way to go. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just, you know, joking just a little bit. I do know my way around some. But I'm just telling you that, you know, we don't know what the, the big cities they go through and what kind of mess that they, they get into. So the Apostle Paul gave us warnings of those days also. In 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4, the Apostle Paul exhorted to Timothy, in verse 3 of chapter 4, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Now there's two meanings of sound. The sound that you use your ears to do and hear. But I believe that what he is talking about when he talks about enduring sound doctrine is solid. Yes. Amen. Unmovable. Irreputable. Yes. I believe that's what he is directing these words toward. Will not ensure, endure the sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fable. You know, you hear some of these preachers, and I say that lightly, you hear some that get up and preach and it sounds like they're telling you a fable. It sounds like they're telling you, uh, trying to keep your attention on an interesting little story. I, I'm all about story. I love stories. Love to read a good book. I'm uh, looking forward to Pastor Marty's book. I, I kid around with him a lot. And I probably shouldn't say this, but I say I hope it's a good Western. <laughs> I know it's not. It's, a, it's going to be a very, very good book and very in thoughtful. And I'm, I can't wait to read it. I'm, I'm anticipating getting this book. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth. Why would Paul mention this in his writing to Timothy and tell Timothy and, and all that were with them that day that to be aware that there's going to be people that are going to reject sound doctrine? Well, the reason that Paul was telling him these people this because he knew of what was going to happen among men and women of that day and this day. They're turning their ears away. I don't want to hear the, the fables. I don't want to hear, I don't want to hear uh, uh, something that's going to uh, cause me to, to, to feel condemnation. I want to hear that I'm okay and that everything's going to be okay. And Jesus is love. Well, all those things are right. Mm -hmm. Jesus is love. And if we uh, hold on to the end, everything is going to be okay. Yes. But if we turn our ears to, uh, away from what really the Bible is trying to tell us yes. and ignore sound doctrine of what the Bible teaches about our walk with God, if we ignore those things, could we be lost? Something for you to think about. I'm not your judge. I would never stand up here and tell you you're going to be lost. That's not my job. Right. I got enough to work with right here, standing here. Amen. I'm still trying to keep myself saved, Sister Jenny, Brother Ben. I'm still trying to keep myself right. in line with the Word of God and with truth. So, I'm just 
just a trumpet on the wall. I'm just trying to blow the trumpet and, and trying to be a mouthpiece for God. Because Paul was warning them that there's going to be people that are going to totally ignore the truth about the Word of God. They're going to turn a deaf ear to it. They don't want to hear it if it upsets their apple cart, if it turns them a, a, a different way, if it upsets them, they don't want to hear it. I am so glad that when I came to the Lord that there was an old minister that did not, did not mind to hurt my feelings when it comes to the Word of God. Not mind telling me you're a sinner. You're either going to repent or you're going to split hell wide open. That was just their mannerism in that day. We, we have a little bit better manners these days. We try to keep things civil and we try to love and help people find truth and, and endure and try to help them. <laughs> so I'd say endure them, but... We don't want to say that. Yeah. The first five gives us another warning, but watch thou in all things, Paul said. Watch thou in all things. Endure affliction. Do the work of the landless. Make full proof of the ministry. So the Bible in the New Testament, all the way through the Gospels, all the way through the Apostles, and, and all the writings of Paul and everything that he, he wrote about, there was warnings. There was writings there to encourage and help us as individuals to serve God in a more perfect life. There's things in the Word of God that will tear down the things that are in your life and then build you back up and make you a stronger and better Christian. And that's what we're, we're striving for. You're not looking at a perfect Christian up here, my friend. I'm sorry, but I'm not looking at perfect Christians either. So it goes both ways. But the thing that we have, the advantage we have, we can have an advocate. The Bible says we can have an advocate with the Father. In other words, we can go to an altar of prayer. If anybody can sit on a church pew and sit through a powerful move of God in a church service and sit there and never bow on the knee to God, I don't care if you've been serving God 40 years. If you can't come to an altar of prayer when altar call is given, you got a problem. If you can't go to God and say, God, forgive me, even though I'm serving you, even I'm doing the best I can, God, there's got to be something in my flesh that's wrong. Help me. We don't endure serving God. We enjoy serving God. It's not a trial to serve God. It's a blessing. It is a privilege to serve God. Everything that we do in our walk with God is a privilege coming from God. We walk with him because we love him. We want to serve him. Amen. Amen. So Paul was warning them that there's going to be people that will not endure sound doctrine. They just, they won't do it. They'll turn from the truth. And now, are those the ones that's going to hear that uh, false prophet telling them soft, soothing words to, to lure them into the temple to worship the Antichrist? It's something to think about. It's something to, to, to be aware of. Huh? Yeah, it is. It's something that we can be aware of that if we don't be the one, if we can't take the word of God doctrinally and examine it and do the best we can to live up to it, then we could be the one that says, what's that teacher that, that was itching my ear, that was scratching my ear the other day? I want to hear from him. It's all about him. Yes. It is all about him. And we're 
We're just pilgrims in this land. We're just doing our best to endure unto the end. I don't know what all we're going to have to endure. I don't know what all we're going to have to go through. But it's going to take a real man and a real woman of God. Faithful, that endured, that, that opened their ears to the word of God. That had a prayerful, concentrated life. That is humble and meek before God. It's not a big I and a little you in the kingdom of God. Okay? It don't matter whether I'm up here or I'm in the pew. We all have the same opportunity to serve God. Ephesians 4 and 11 through 14. I'd like to read some more before I run out of time. I got plenty of time. It's 8.30, right? I quit at 8.30? Yeah, right. Okay. You can get by with that. So Ephesians 4, beginning at verse 11. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Now he's telling you that you have all the tools. We have all the tools. He gave apostles, he gave prophets, he gave evangelists, he gave pastors, and he gave teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. We are the ones that make up this ministry. He said in verse 13, till we all come in the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children. Now, I might add that there is degrees of Christian walk. There are those that are just children in Christ that do things that, you know, they haven't been taught better yet. But then there's that mature Christian that knows what it takes to really serve God and be that Christian. That they sometimes know to do better than the things they do. When your child, and you, you taught that child, now you don't run down the street. You you stay in the yard. You don't get out there in the street. And as soon as your back's turned, out in the street they go. Well, you maybe one time you'll bring them back and tell them, I told you, don't do this again. You know better. I've told you. I gave you it. I'm telling you, don't get out there in that street. Well, as soon as you turn your back, right out there in the street they go. Well, do you just turn around and say, Oh, well, I told them. If they get run over, well, I told them. Or do you endure with them? Of course you do. Nobody wants to see their children run over in the street, so you will go get that child. Give it a good slap on the face. Places that cannot be seen. And you will set them down you will tell them, I told you once. I even warned you the second time. But now, you've got to pay the price. And that's what Jesus is doing to his church today. He said, I've warned you. I told you. I, I'm telling you now. The next time that you know better, What's the Bible say about they that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to them is sin. Mm -hmm. So we're, that henceforth we're no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight 
of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ. Now I'm telling you things tonight that will help you in your walk with God. If you will take it and you will work with it and you will, you will take it and you'll walk with God and you will apply it to your daily walk, you'll understand that and you'll grow in God. This is the key. You know, God doesn't expect you to stay immature as a Christian. He expects you to advance as Christians. We're all adults here except for the little baby there. Sister Star is holding it. But we're all adults. We know. We can't stay at one a childish level. God is expecting us to advance to the next level. Be an adult in Christianity. Whoops. So here we are. not got the best organized here. I've just got a little paper stuck in here to mark my place, so be patient with me. Second Thessalonians also talked of things, and I promise you we will get back into the end time lesson, but I just kind of felt something maybe just break things up a little bit. Uh, second Thessalonians, the second chapter, Let's begin at verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means. Well, here he is again, warning. Here's a warning. Here it is. Let no man deceive you by any means. By any means. But don't be deceived by those soft, uh, uh, easy preachers that say anything will go. Just come on in. We're all going. Because that's, that's the broad way. You understand that Jesus warned about that. There's a broad way and then there's that straight and narrow. Let no man deceive you by any means for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. And we all know who that is. That's going to be the Antichrist and he's going to be revealed. We're all going to know who he is. Everybody sitting here will know him because you've heard it. You know when he stands up in the temple and declares himself to be God, you're going to say, oh, I remember that. He's, he is committing the uh, abomination of desolation. He's the Antichrist. Who oppresseth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. Now you know what without withholdeth that he might be revealed in time. For the mystery of iniquity doeth always already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Excuse me. And for this cause, verse 11, for this cause, in Second Thessalonians 2, and for this cause God shall send them strong delusions that they should believe a lie. Now who's going to believe a lie? Well, I'll tell you who it is. It's going to be that reprobate. It's going to be that Reprobate is just somebody that uh, just rejects God altogether, rejects his truth, rejects his word. Uh, the definition for the reprobate is a doctrine which teaches that a person can reject the gospel to a point where God, it, where God turns, rejects them, and curses their 
conscience. And that's just one, I mean, I don't have time to go into all that, but there's just one definition of a reprobate. I'm going to get to Romans 1, verse 28, and I'm going to have to uh, close out here just in about, five, i got five minutes. We want to be respectful of the time. <clears throat> Romans 1. Let's read in here. <clears throat> Beginning at verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convincing, being filled with all unrighteousness. Now here it is. Fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit. Uh, I don't know what that word is. But I, yeah, you got it. You can read it. Backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, Inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they would commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in doing in them that do them. Now this is where God turns individuals like this over to their own reprobatable way. I mean, if God can't change these people, he has no choice. They, they have signed their own warrant. They have signed their own uh, way. When you reject God, time and time and time again, and he's reaching for you over and over and over, then obviously the only thing he can do is turn you over to a reprobated mind that you would believe a lie and be damned. So the things that we are warned about in the word of God are true. They are not fairy tales. They are not just stories. These are things that will bring to our minds when time comes upon us and things begin to happen in our world and we see these things coming to pass. We can finally realize and bring it back to our memory that there's going to be false teachers. There's going to be people with great influence that's going to try to influence you away from the true word of God. So if you can believe a false doctrine and be lost, man, I hope that I might have said something and I definitely did not want to offend or hurt anyone. You know, I want to preach love. I want to preach peace. I want to preach happiness. Man, but sometimes that does not fall our lot. Sometimes we just have to preach what the Word of God calls and what it is and let the people deal with it themselves. Nobody in this church, uh, any, in any church, is going to go back there and grab you by the nap of the neck and throw you in an altar and say, repent, you, you get the Holy Ghost right now. Nobody's going to do that. Right. You have a choice. Man, you have a choice. You can either go, and go to heaven with God forever and live in glorious happiness for the rest of eternity. But the alternative is not so sweet. Man, that's why we got to, as, as the church of the living God, we got to be more than just pew warmers. We got to be more than just, I go to church. You got to be more than just, I'm a member. But you got to be the church of the living God. You got to find your groove or where you are, and you got to get in there with sincerity yes. and faithfulness and serve God and reach for people. Man, man, God bless you tonight. I mean, I'm right on the ball. 
up there as a scripture came to my mind Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9 this is the reason why we need the warnings of the word the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it I the Lord search the heart I try the reins even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings and the problem with our itching ears is that you can make the word say really whatever you want it to say if you allow your own heart uh, to control your response to the word you know it's kind of humorous whether um, Hoyne was talking about uh, my book that's coming out and uh, I hope I do hope that you enjoy it some of the stuff that was talked about tonight uh, chapter 13 uh, goes into some of that in detail but uh, the book went live on Amazon and Three days later, I went to check the stats on the book. You know, hardly anybody knows the book out that was out there, as far as I knew. But I was shocked to find that uh, my book was already number 21 wow. on the new releases under spiritual devotions. Praise God! Wow. And boy, I thought, man, that is wow! I am really something. Number 21 already. I have cracked not only the top 100, the top 50, but the top 25. And then I checked the overall Amazon ranking, ranking and I came in at 494,000 <laughs> something. You see, we can we can kind of make the stats say anything we want to. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. But we need to be careful of the Word of God that we don't take a subset of a subset of a subset yeah. of a subset down until we get it to just that one scripture that we were warned is of no private interpretation and uh, make it say what we want it to say. But we need to reconcile the word with the rest of the scriptures. And I can, I can tell you this, in all of uh, my life, I have found this to be true. The word of God does not contradict itself. If I think I found a contradiction, I need to study the word because there's something that I'm missing. Amen. God bless you. Let's stand together. Thank you, Brother Toy. What a wonderful lesson tonight. I'm just encouraged. Thank you.